Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue in our study in the book of Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 62. Psalm 62. Now, before we begin, like we learned back in the First Thing series, we need to make sure that we confess our known sins and at the same time allow the Holy Spirit to control us. He indwells us, but we have to choose to let him control. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. This psalm is about what to do in times of trouble. It's going to teach us to seek God for help and deliverance, and it's going to teach us also to rest. What does it mean to rest? To rest in the Lord. This psalm also talks about the true nature of men, that is, of mankind, that in the heart of the unrighteous person, he is unreliable. He can't be trusted. But for the believer, his strength comes from relying on God, trusting God. And one of the things that's interesting about this psalm, it doesn't actually uh, speak to God until you get to the end of it talks about God, but doesn't speak to God. This is another lament psalm. It's a lament psalm for the individual who is also trusting in God. It's what we call a song of trust. But as you can see at this chart, it's under the larger category of lament psalm. We've studied these Three, studying the third one right now, Psalm 62. It's an individual song of trust, but it's also under the lament psalm heading. Now, listen to this short and simple message. I'll put it on the board so we can read it together. Always rely on the all-powerful God and do not trust in unreliable man. Let's get a glance at the outline. Just to let you know where we're going, you've seen indexes in the front of books or table of contents. This tells us where we're going. It's 12 verses long. Confidence in the God alone. Man is unreliable, verses 3 and 4. God is my salvation, verses 5 through 8. Trust not in man, but God, verses 9 through 12. Let's begin. The superscription... To the director of music, to Jeduthun of David. That tells us that the director of music is Jeduthun. So David would hand it over to him to uh, work with for the choir. Uh, the author is David. That's what it means when it says, of David. Now we begin the expression of confidence in God in verse 1. For God alone, I, then I have a word, nephish, wait in silence. From him comes my salvation. This tells us that we have to learn to trust in God. The word I, notice I got this brackets around this word nephish. That's the inner you. Sometimes you'll see people translate this soul, but that's a little misleading because people can't define that very well. What it means is it's, who you are. If you take your uh, nephish out of you, you're a dead person. All you have is a body. When your nephish enters your body, you become a human being. So you're made up of your nephish and your physical body. And God adds a spirit in there. That way you can relate to him if you're born again and you're saved. You get spiritual life. But the nephish is what makes us a person when it's connected to a body. When your nephish leaves, you're dead. 
<laughs> okay, well, for God alone, I wait in silence. An important part of trusting God is learning how to wait. We call that resting. Resting and trusting in Him. We're going to learn what resting means. Resting is basically trusting God while you wait. Trusting God while you wait. And don't miss that little phrase at the end here, in silence. That means you're not always talking about what you need. You just wait. Okay? The psalmist also writes, from him comes my salvation. Now, we usually think of salvation in terms of being saved and going to heaven. But salvation in the Old Testament understanding meant a lot more than that. It means more than that in the New Testament understanding too. But it means you're going to be delivered, physically delivered or rescued somehow as well. But you want to be saved and not go to hell. You want to be saved in times of trouble, right? That's basically what it means. And sometimes it combines those meanings. We want to live a life where we are constantly trusting in God and having him continually deliver us through this world until we get to heaven. Notice one more word again, that first line, alone. It's only God we can trust in. Man won't do it. That's something we've learned. Man won't help. Uh, I've told you how man can help sometime. Yeah, you can call the plumber when you need your water leak fixed, but really, you have to be trusting in God all the time for your life so you can do his will. Patience is one of the great virtues of a growing Christian. You learn how to wait. You learn how to rest. Do not try and rush things. Sometimes when you're young, you want to hurry up and grow up so you can do certain things. Uh, maybe you can go to the movie on your own. You can learn how to drive. Uh, maybe you are no longer considered a minor. Well, the problem with not being a minor is that when you're uh, an adult, you have bigger responsibilities. But don't miss the idea of waiting and resting and being quiet in the Lord. Listen to this in verse 2. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. All of these terms, rock, salvation, and fortress, are things that God provides for us. David has a biblical worldview of life. Again, notice, he alone, God alone. God is the one who provides the place of refuge. That's what the idea is. You go up on a cliff, so no one can get up there. If they do, it's going to be very difficult. And you can easily defend that position if it's the enemy. Or you can hide up there. And they don't always want to make the big trip up the side of the mountain to find you where you are. The point is, that is our place of refuge, a place of defense. The idea is also in the word fortress. Fortress. You know what a fortress is? It's like a fort. Right, it's like a fort. He's your defense. God alone is our defense. He protects us from the evils of this world, gives us the discernment, helps us make good decisions so we can wade through all the junk out there. Then the last line, I shall not be shaken, greatly shaken. That means that you're going to depend upon God. He'll keep you stable. He'll keep you from falling over and landing on your head. That's the idea. He will keep you from falling apart. So the point here is the psalmist, David, psalmist, he's confident that God will hold him together. A bigger perspective on this is to understand that God saves us initially when we trust in Jesus Christ. He delivers us through this life um, and justifies us. They also use the word vindication so that we're qualified to go to heaven and be with him forever. That's our ultimate salvation. 
So while still in these mortal bodies on earth, we trust in him for our stability, our defense, and our deliverance, and then finally to hold us together. And might I just add again, don't forget to wait. There are times to wait. This builds up your character. You're waiting for God to do something. God, I need some help here. I need an answer here. And it's quiet. A week later, you go again. Lord, I really, really need some help. It's quiet. It's really quiet. You say, oh, what's going on? What's going on? There's no answer. Well, actually, there is an answer. The answer for right now is wait. <laughs> Trust God. Rest. Believe what his word says. In the meantime, God will give you the strength to wait if you trust in him. And the sooner we learn this, especially when we're young, we'll learn how to depend on him and him alone for our strength. Besides, why would you want to go out and do something on your own and make a big mistake? Wait. Wait. Don't let the world have you do something you shouldn't do. If you're not sure, don't do it. If you have to make a decision, then you make the best one that you can at the time with the information you have. But trust God in doing it. And if God doesn't want you to do it, he'll shut it down. As you get older and you learn how to drive, <clears throat> I'm going to go to the grocery store. Okay, so I go out there and I get ready to get in my car and I go to the grocery store. car doesn't start. Oh, no. And I can't get it fixed today. Well, I guess I'm not going to the grocery store today. See, you just got stopped, didn't you? Well, that can happen in many ways, in major ways. You may not get... Uh, into the school you wanted to, if you want to go to school or get the training or the job, because that's not for you. You have to trust God every moment in the process. And as soon as you realize you have to make a big decision, you go to God and talk to him. Now, where does man come in? Here's where man comes in, and we find out that man is unreliable. You can't rely on him. You can't trust him. That's in verses 3 and 4. And in doing this, we're going to see how hateful and resentful people can be. Now, this is a very strong and negative description of people. People in general, not everyone. Uh, a good Christian won't be this way. We see how resentful and hateful people can be, how unreliable and unstable they are. So you can't trust them. Now, there are some people you learn to trust because you get to know them. It may be a teacher, maybe a coach, it may be a friend of your parents, but you can learn to trust them and they're reliable. It may be someone, well, if you attend a church, someone in your church, but just remember this, no one is perfectly reliable except God. Now, this describes how some really rotten unbelievers act. It's like you're talking to them. The psalmist is talking to them, all right? He's asking them some questions. How long will you attack a man? You see that in verse 3? You just keep on attacking people for no good reasons. That you may murder him? Now, that's pretty strong, isn't it? And then look at this phrase after it. All of you, all of you want to hurt people. Well, now, if you haven't learned this yet, you're going to find when you grow up that this is true of a lot of people. They really don't care about others. It's all about themselves. They have their own interest in mind. I'm not saying we don't take care of ourselves, but they really don't care about other people's lives or their welfare. They pretend to. We'll see some, a verse on that, too. Here's what they're like. Look at the last line. Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. Now, have you ever had a leaning wall? Uh, you may see them in some of those old sheds if you drive out in the country. They got them old, old barns or houses, and they got a whole wall. Looks like it's about ready to fall. Now, that's not a place you want to walk into, is it? It's too dangerous. 
Or you have a fence that's about ready to fall over. You've seen those too probably. And if you don't fix them uh, or add some support or something, they'll probably fall over. In the meantime, they're dangerous. You don't want to play a game under a leaning wall, right? And this is compared to these men who attack people and murder people. They're dangerous. You can't trust them. Now, young people, you might not hear this from anybody else, but you cannot trust people. There's only a few select people you can trust. Hopefully, if you have a good pastor, you can trust him, your parents, uh, friends that are proved trustworthy. But people can fail you. And you have to learn not to totally trust someone because people are weak. They might say, well, I meant to do that, but I just, I was just afraid. And so they let you down. Or they don't back you up when you thought they would. You, you told the truth, you did the right thing, and when they get called in, they're the ones that really did it, and they don't want to tell what really happened. Well, they chickened out on you, you see. People can be like that, even friends. They can. Now, I'm not saying don't make friends. Of course make friends. But just be careful about how much you trust in people. You know, people are always putting themselves first. They think they're the most important, what they think and what they do. And for them to keep this viewpoint, they have to keep running down others. So they're always attacking people, sometimes viciously, with their words. And if they could, they'd probably kill them. And I'm not kidding you. So that's why it comes out so strong in this middle line. Don't miss this. This is God's truth that you may murder him. You people out there to murder people. You really want to get rid of people. I think we saw this recently in some of the activity that the world's governments were doing, and they still are. They're passing laws and making people do things that are actually dangerous to their lives. And that's where you really have to rely on your parents to be discerning. Don't trust the government. That's just a bunch of people, right? Or even the health uh, health organizations. They can lie too, especially when there's big money to be made. Pretty strong words. Here's what they want to do, verse 4. They only plan to thrust him down. That's the good person. They want to thrust down their victims from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehoods. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. This tells us that these type of people, and there's a lot of them out there, they're always out there to knock someone down. They may uh, have a higher position in authority or some sort of status. They may be uh, the person in charge or the teacher or the police officer. They want to run them down. Makes them look good if they can make that person above them go down. That's what they think anyway. Look at the second line. They take pleasure in falsehood. They like to lie. They like to deceive. They like to tell people things to mislead them. That's a form of deception. One of the things they do, the last couple of lines, they bless with their mouths. They say good things about people, but inwardly they're cursing them. You have a wonderful day. I uh, hope you get sick. See what I'm saying? Well, I hope you're very successful in that job of yours. I uh, wish you'd lose your job so I could have it. You see? That's the way they are. So this doesn't say a whole lot good about man either, does it? What we just read in verses 3 and 4. But what you've got to learn is, in contrast to God, that is, Compared to God, man doesn't compare. He is terribly unreliable. He'll lie, he'll cheat. And don't miss this phrase up here, take pleasure. They enjoy this. They enjoy getting away with deceiving people, with lying. Some people make their living at it. 
Well, who do we rely on? We come back to verses 5 through 8 where it tells us, God is my salvation. Now listen, there's a lot of application here. Let's get this right. Now we have a line we've seen already. For God alone, I, there's your word nephish, wait in silence. There's your waiting. For my hope is from God. Earlier it was about salvation in the second line. This one's about hope. The idea is that while we are waiting for God to do something, we're hoping in him. Now we learned earlier that our salvation and deliverance comes from him. Now we hope. That's confidence that God is going to do something. It's not empty hope. Well, I hope so. You ever heard that? No, this is saying, I know God's going to do that. He's our hope. His word says so, and I'm resting on his promises. Resting on the promises of God. So let me use the board a moment. All right, let's get a picture of a book here. All right, we can call it the Bible, but let's just put it this way. Let's call it the promises of God. Many promises in the Bible to the believer on God. Uh, he is faithful towards you. He loves you. He'll take care of you. He'll supply your needs. He'll protect you from evil. He'll give you strength to deal with things, all kinds of promises. You can read the Bible all the time and see promises. We put our trust in God's promises. We know God wants his best for us, that things will work out for good for those who love him. Don't miss that important condition, love him. We trust in the promises of God, and we do that when we do that, we are resting. You're resting in God. And you're waiting. Let's write that up there. You're waiting. What was the other word we saw related to this? And we're just silent. We're just quietly waiting. You're not out there to accomplish anything right now. You're going to see what God does in your life, what door he opens. He might not open anything for a long, long time. And the message is, well, you need to grow spiritually. That may be it. That's often the case. People always want to rush out and do something. Just grow spiritually. It doesn't make any difference what your job is while you're growing spiritually. You've got to get on your feet so you can walk spiritually, walk day by day with the Lord. Now, you as a young person, <clears throat> the younger you are, you got a big start on most people. And you can get way ahead in your spiritual life and be a mature believer by the time you're, well, maybe a, a, a late teenager. Maybe by 18 years old, you're a mature believer. Boy, we need a lot of those out there right now. Waiting for some relief, something to get out of your way, someone to do something some door to open up in your life. That's a good part of the Christian life. Why? Because that teaches us to trust the promises of God. The second line, why can we do this? For our hope is from him. We usually hope for some sort of good outcome. Let me tell you, sometimes God just gives us what's best for us. It may not seem so good, but if it's God's best for us, that's perfect. We're to learn to trust in who? In God alone. Then we come back to some of those familiar phrases. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Here we go again. Same line almost completely. And the other earlier one, we had not be greatly shaken. This is just has shaken. The idea is, you're trusting in the rock. He's our defense. He's our refuge. He's our deliverer. He's our fortress. Nothing can touch us that God doesn't allow. You know, one of the lessons you learn if you ever go into the military or police officer where you're a dangerous profession, the truth of the matter is you're as safe on the battlefield as you are in bed if God is watching over you. Do you understand that? 
It's hard, hard one for mothers to learn. And fathers, too, when your son goes into battle, he's just as safe in bed as he is in the battlefield if he's a Christian and trusting in God. Woe is him if he's not a Christian and he goes into battle. You don't know what's going to happen. But just understand, we learn to trust God no matter what the circumstances. And he will keep you together. It's not that you won't have things that will puzzle you and disturb you. But shaking here, I think, is uh, seriously shaken so that you're turned upside down. That won't happen. You won't fall apart if you're trusting in God. Verse 7, connected thought. On God rests my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Now we've seen some of these words already, haven't we? Now what's just said a different way. On God rests my salvation. Now, see the italics that the rest is in? That's not in the original language. It just says, in the original Hebrew, it says, On God, my salvation. That's a way of saying, On God is dependent, your salvation. And your glory, what you get out of your life that God gives you, comes from Him. Whatever you do worthwhile for God, that comes from God. He is the rock of my strength. We've already said he's our rock. He's the one that gives you strength. And notice all the my's here. See all the my's? My, 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 my. The psalmist realize, he realizes that God is mine for these things. And you remember that. God is your salvation. He will give you your salvation. You depend on him. He is your strength. He is your refuge. He is your glory. Verse 8 is a call for all who are godly, that would be Christians, living the Christian life as they should, to put their trust in him. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. This has some interesting explanations. First one is very good just to listen. Trust in him at all times. You people, you people listening to this, hearing this. That's all believers who choose to serve God. Here's what you're supposed to do. You're trusting in him. That means Pouring out your heart before him. The word for pouring, let me tell you something about that. We think about pouring out maybe a glass of milk or juice or something like that or a bucket of water. In those days, they poured out dirt. They say, dirt? Yes. If they were going to attack a fortress, let me just see if I can kind of draw this for you. If they're going to attack a fortress with a high wall like this, you know what they do? Let's say, let's just put a man up here just to show you how big this wall is. Okay, here's a man. How are we going to climb that wall? What they would do, they would start hauling dirt in and start dumping it. But they'd have to do it by hand. They'd use large baskets and they would dump it. And they would dump it. It may take months, and I'm not kidding you. It may take months. If this fort is on top of a mountain, there's a well-known fortress in Israel called Masada. M-A-S-A-D-A. -A -A. Look it up, and you'll see the Romans built a ramp all the way up by keeping dumping dirt. Can you imagine the tons of dirt that they brought in? And pretty soon they have a ramp up to where they can get on the wall. In the meantime, they're fighting off the enemy from on top. The famous battle was fought there. So they keep filling it with dirt. That's the idea, pouring out dirt. A couple of scriptures just to show you. 2 Samuel 20, 15. Ezekiel 17, 17. Now the idea here is to pour out your hearts. In other words, you're going to pour out your thoughts to God. God, I don't know how this is going to work out. I feel terrible. I didn't want to hurt anybody. 
but I need to make a decision here and I don't know what to do. No one will help me. No one advise me that I, I think is right. So you have to wait and you wait. And while you wait, you keep pouring out your thoughts to God. Now, is this different than being silent? If you know that you're going to have to wait for an answer, then just be quiet. If you're not sure what you're looking for, keep talking to God. You can always talk to God. Don't misunderstand me. But you don't want to complain or don't say, well, if God had only answered my prayer, don't be silly. He'll answer your prayer according to his will when he's good and ready. Okay? But tell God your troubles. Lay it out before him. This is part of the rest. Once you do that, then you're quiet, you see. Tell God your problems, then you're quiet. Then you rest, then you're silent. And you wait. It may be a day or two or three or weeks or months or maybe a couple of years. Finally, God is a refuge for us. We've seen this several times, a couple times at least. This time the psalmist is saying, I know it. God is a refuge for us. He is. He's confident here. And then Selah is something the psalmist writes in there. It's part of a musical, um, part of the musical thing for the choir or perhaps for instruments to stop or repeat or something like that. Verse 9. This is where we learn about man. Listen to this. Sons of man, that's mankind, are only a breath, as sons of man, human beings, are lie. And the balances, they go up, they are together lighter than air. Now, earlier we talked about man being so cruel, attacking man, right? And being like murderers all the time. This is more telling us about what man is made up of. We see two phrases, sons of man and sons of man. Even though the word man is different words in the Hebrew, they amount to basically mankind or human beings, people in general. First, they are said, are only a breath. Well, being only a breath means a couple of things. There's no substance. They're just air. They're vapor. Okay? The lives of people are without substance when they don't know God. They pass on without notice. Oh, they may be a film star and have films around for 100 years after they've passed. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who have substance and meaning in this world before God. Men in general are like that. They have meaningless lives. <clears throat> I mean that. Listen, meaningless lives. You say, well, he set all sorts of records in high school. Meaningless. He made more money than anybody else we know. Meaningless. He has a huge family without God, meaningless. Do you understand? Listen to James for a moment. This is the New Testament book of James from 414b, the second half of that verse. I'll put it on the board. For you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I often think of someone who smokes a pipe. They blow out some smoke. What does that smoke do? Well, it's there for a few seconds, and then it's gone. Poof. See, that's like our lives. Very short. But this verse, this first line says more than that. Not only is it short, but it has no meaning. It goes on to say, second line, as sons of men are lie. So, their lives have no substance as their lives are a lie. They live for the wrong reason. They live for lies. 
They live for falsehood. They live to be something. And here's the thing. What is the something? Meaningless. And I'll be very honest with you. Life without God is meaningless. It amounts to nothing. Oh, but they had so much fun up there on the stage and dancing and singing and popular and all that attention. Meaningless. Meaningless. They're going to grow old and die. And are they going to go to heaven? Or are they going to go to hell? If they live for God, they go to heaven and they get rewarded. If not, they're judged. Well, both of these types of people, that is, those who are liars and those whose lives are a breath, notice the last two lines. And the balances they go up, they are together lighter than air. You ever went to a doctor's office and stood on a scale? Sure you have. Have you ever seen those scales? They show them the old-timey uh, grocery stores or they'll have them in the a meat department where they weigh the meat and put maybe a, uh, on a scale of some sort. Well, in those days, they had two pans, one on each side. They'd put the weights on one side and and make the uh, other pan full of meat till it got to where it's supposed to match that weight so they're even across, if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, the, the, the point here is that when you balance mankind like this, they're lighter than air. What does that tell you? They don't even show up for a reading. They don't have a reading on the scale. If they were stepping in the doctor's office and step on those scales, it'd still stay zero. Now, this is strong truth, is what I call it. It's strong truth. It's hard for people to take. Without God, life is without any weight. There is no significance no real substance. It's just a person on earth for a very short time and then poof, they're gone. Not only is their life insignificant, but it was a lie. And you know, a lot of people realize, realize that in their life. I've lived an insignificant life. Yes, I might have raised a family. I may have worked hard at my job and people respected me, but without God, that's not gonna amount to anything. Spiritually, they are dead. So all they do is damage, damage to themselves, damage to others. Without God, they have short, meaningless lives. Now, I know that this gives you a different view on people around you. Doesn't mean we don't witness to them. If we witness to them, they trust in Christ, then they have meaning. They have substance. But that's a warning for us to remember that these are not people to idolize or people to follow or even people to admire. Well, sure, we like somebody who's a good supervisor and a good boss, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about at the heart of this person, inside their thoughts and their motives, why they do things in life, who are they living for? You know, when you were saved, if it was just for you to be saved and be and go to heaven, then why are you still here? You ever think about that? We've talked about Solomon, especially if you've been with me in the um, David series or uh, in Proverbs. He was considered the wisest man on earth because God gave him special wisdom. You know what he learned about life? He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read from the first chapter. I'm going to read, I think, from the next to the last chapter. So basically he learned through his life's experiences these things. I'm just going to read you some verses. Here we go. First chapter, 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities. Let me explain what vanity means. It means meaningless. Meaningless. So this is kind of a chant. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, that's Solomon. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 
I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. Now, if you don't know the story of Solomon, he was the richest man. He was the wisest man. He had huge material wealth, palaces. Uh, David handed him over the greatest kingdom on earth at the time, God's people. And he accomplished many things. But he learned that without God, life is meaningless. That's a hard lesson to learn for some people. Listen to 11.8. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. Let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. That's what happens when you die. You go into darkness. All that comes is vanity. In other words, you make a lot of money, a recognition and power and everything everybody ever desired in life. It's meaningless. And the lesson behind all this, without God, life is meaningless. Straight A's are meaningless. <laughs> you can tell your mom and dad that they might not quite understand, but say, well, without God, mom and dad, whatever we accomplish is meaningless. And then they should understand if they're Christians and they know the word. Verse 10 tells us some of the things that people trust in to get things. Do not trust in oppression. You know, oppression is uh, pushing people around, getting money from them. If you don't do this, I'm going to take your business. If you don't give me a, you know, you see this in gangster movies. If you don't pay us every month for just being here, we're going to run your business. Okay? That's oppression. And do not rely on robbery. You know what robbery is. People just coming up and taking things from you. You don't rob people to make it in life. You don't rob people to, to gain your wealth, right? If wealth increases, do not set your heart on it. Now, this would be if you legitimately made wealth. I mean, legitimately, that is, you worked for it. You got wealth correctly, the right way, even the godly way. But you don't set your heart on it. That's not what we trust in. You don't trust in wealth because it can disappear. You know, a lot of people make a lot of money. They work all their lives to make a lot of money so they get them to their 60s and 70s. Now they got to work to keep it. And that's the way life often is if your life is living for money. Don't miss this last line. Do not set your heart on it. Do not trust in it. That's what it's saying. Don't trust in it. That's not the goal of your life. At the end of your life, you'll find out <clears throat> you can't take a bag of money to heaven with you. And it'll burn in hell. <laughs> Jesus taught on this subject one of the great lines. Matthew 19.23 Disciples wondered how rich people can get into heaven because so many of them really struggle with turning to God because they've learned to rely just on themselves and their money. Jesus, then Jesus said to his disciples, this is in Matthew 19, 23, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. You know why that is? Why is it hard for rich people to be saved? Because they've learned to depend upon themselves and themselves alone. They'll tell you, I've never needed God to be successful in this world. The problem with that is our goal in life is not to be successful. It's to please God. That is true success. Or they've learned to just rely on themselves or they think they've been so good. I mean, I've given away millions of dollars. I must get to heaven. Why wouldn't God let me in? Because you're a sinner and you never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior. You never followed Christ. Well, I don't need to follow Christ. I'm doing good on my own. You do need to follow Christ. You must follow Christ or you will not get to heaven. Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor. Listen to what he tells Timothy to tell the rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, 
which is so uncertain. Notice, uncertain. That's like being unreliable. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our, notice this, enjoyment. You want true happiness? You want to truly enjoy things? Put your hope in God. He'll provide enjoyment in life. This is another way of saying, you want to have a good life? You want to have a happy life? Trust in God. Make your goal in life to be more devoted to following Jesus Christ. Verse 11, interesting verse. God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God. This is telling us that God has said this more than once, perhaps in one way or the other, that power belongs to him. Strength, might, power. That's what we've learned. Remember, he is our rock. He is our fortress, our refuge. As the psalmist put it, my strength. He's my power. He's my rock. He's my fortress. What you learn from this psalm is that God is your strength. And we've also seen the point in the next verse in many ways. And loving kindness is yours, Lord, for you reward a person according to his work. Remember the word loving kindness. I like to, I like to show that to you. Kessid, remember that? Kessid. God's kind love, his loyal love, his devoted love to you. God will love you and treat you in kindness and take care of you and so on. And then for you reward a person according to his work. Now this tells us something that we need to remember. God is a rewarder of those who do good for him. He pays back people for what they've done on earth. Now let's understand something, what we mean by work. It's not just going out and doing anything. For the believer, the believer is the only one who can do divine good good that is rewardable. An unbeliever can't do it. An unbeliever in no way can please God. He's too corrupt. So everything he does is corrupt. Listen to what kind of work we're talking about. I put it on the board. A person's work indicates his righteousness before God. If his heart is right before God, then his production will be rewarded. So what we're saying is it's important that when you do work for God, what condition is your heart in? It must start with a person with a righteous heart, one who's trusted in Jesus Christ, and then he does the right things for God. That is the work that is rewardable. The only work the unbeliever will get paid back in, he'll get it paid back in judgment, Pay back in judgment. If you study Revelation, you know what I'm talking about. This principle of reward for works is taught in both the Old and the New Testament. Let's look at a couple of verses. I'll look at Psalm 28.4, where the psalm is saying to God, Give back to them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. See, there's judgment. Give back to them according to the work of their hands. Repay them what is due them. This is a judgment on the unbeliever. Jeremiah 17, 10. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give each person according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. It's another word for works. Matthew 16, 27. Let's go ahead and put two up there this time. I'll read one after the other. New Testament verses. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. This is when Jesus comes back the next time. And will then repay every person according to his deeds. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Paul writes, now the one who plants and the one who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. 
That's according to his work. So, first thing, make sure your heart's right with God. And then serve him. Do the right thing. All right, let's close by reading through our psalm. Psalm 62. To the director of music, to Jaduthun of David. For God alone, I, Nephish, wait in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will you attack a man that you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse Selah. Verse 5. For God alone I, Nephish, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Sons of man, mankind are only a breath as sons of man, human beings are a lie. And the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than air. Do not trust in oppression and do not vainly rely on robbery. If wealth increases, do not set your heart on it. God has spoken once, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God. And loving kindness is yours, Lord, for you reward a person according to his work. Well, you've learned that we're to trust in God. We're to rest in his truth, to trust him, rely on him for our strength. And he will give you all the strength you need to accomplish his will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. Thank you for the promises you have given us. Thank you that we can trust you. Help us learn to rest in you, in your truth, and your strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.